Good evening. A number of guests duly introduced by fellows are attending your meeting and I welcome them in your name. Minutes. Society of Antiquaries of London, Ordinary Meeting, Thursday 11th of February 2021. This meeting took place online only. Mr. Paul Drury, President and Chair. The minutes of the previous ordinary meeting of Thursday 4th of February 2021 <clears throat> were read and will be signed at Burlington House. The certificates of the following candidates for election were laid before the Society and ordered to be suspended in the usual manner. Richard Henry, Tracy Ireland, Paul Johnson, Stephen Kay and Julian King. The following communication was then laid before the Society. Environed about with galleries and towers, Archbishop Warham's Palace at Otford by President Paul Drury, FSA. Thanks for return for his, this communication before the President closed the meeting. I will sign these minutes as a true and complete record when I manage to get back to Burlington House. Um, if anyone has any corrections, please email the General Secretary. They will be taken into account. This being a meeting for the election of fellows, the following are declared elected at the ballot which closed today at 12 noon. Piers Baker Bates, Richard Bellison, Tracy Borman, Maureen Cassidy Geiger, Susan Deasy, Richard Henry, Tracy Ireland, Paul Johnson, Stephen Kay, and Gillian King. Certificates. Thank you. There are five certificates this evening. Uh, and just a reminder that I'm reading the shortened version uh, of the certificates and fellows can find the longer version on the website. And please don't forget to vote. Graham Kirkham, BAMA, a freelance historic environment consultant who has produced a wide range of rural and urban landscape surveys of Cornwall. Tilna Mann, BSc, MSc, PhD, a senior lecturer and zoo archaeologist whose projects include the investigation of Australia's oldest known site of human habitation. And she is the president of the Australian Archaeological Association. Dominic Maschek, DPhil, Associate Professor of Roman Archaeology and Art at the University of Oxford, whose research focuses on Roman architecture, architectural decoration, urbanism and sculpture. Mariel McClatchy, BA, MA, PhD, Assistant Professor of Archaeology at University College Dublin, whose main area of expertise is archaeobotany. She has published on Irish food, culture and identity. Griffin Murray, BA, MA, PhD, a lecturer in archaeology at University College Cork, whose main research is AD 400 to 1200, and who has published on Viking art, collections history, and objects as agents of power. Thank you. Thank you. These certificates will be suspended in the usual manner, and in the present circumstances, they will be available um, only online um, for inspection. Uh, I now call on our director, Chris Skull, to report on the outcome of this morning's meeting of the research committee. Well, thank you, thank you, Paul. The research committee met this morning to consider this year's research and travel grant applications, and it made uh, 32 awards for research and travel grants, totaling £233,000. Um, this includes four three-year awards from the Arnold Fund um, for projects dealing with aspects of dress and the materials from which it's made. Um, they're very exciting projects and we, we look forward to releasing details and hearing more. The committee also considered the forward programme of lectures and seminars. And just to note that in March, we have the conference on the seals of the people of Britain. In May, we have the Drowned Landscapes Conference. From June, we have a series of events on intertwined histories, legacies, legacies of colonialism and empire. And Research Committee approved a proposal for a conference to be held in spring of 2022 called 
Writing Back and Writing Forwards, Caribbean Histories and Literature in English, a conference which will bring together approaches to European colonization and its legacies for investigating the interfaces between material culture, literature, representative art, architecture, archaeology, and landscape history. I'm pleased to say as well that we now have a full program of ordinary meeting lectures going up to <coughs> December of this year and into January of next, um, and a nearly full program of public, public lectures as well, um, with three themed lectures on aspects of the Tudor court um, due this summer, which are going to be quite exciting. So thank you, Paul. Thank you, Chris. We now come to the main business of today's meeting, which is to hear a paper, The Early Medieval Eye and Insular Art, the Codex Amianta Amiatinus. Amiantinus. Amiatinus. Amiatinus, thank you. Um, the Book of Kells and the Scholarship of Jennifer O'Reilly um, by Dr. Carol Farr, FSA. Carol was formerly Associate Professor of Art History at the University of Alabama in Huntsville. And since 1997 has been based in London, where she is now a research fellow at the University of London's Institute of English Studies. Her books and articles have explored the reception of sculpture in Anglo-Saxon England and made detailed studies of the art of early Latin manuscripts from Ireland and Britain, such as the Book of Kells, the Lindisfarne Gospels, and the Rushworth Gospels. With Elizabeth Mullins of University College Dublin, she co-edited the collected art historical works of Jennifer O'Reilly, published in 2019. Carol, the screen is yours. Thank you. Um, there. Okay. All right. President, fellows, and guests, thank you for an opportunity to speak about the contribution of the late Dr. Jennifer O'Reilly to our growing understanding of early medieval Irish and British art. Since the 1980s, a wealth of archeological discoveries and new archeological methods have revealed so much about the genesis of the visual art style that we call insular. On the screen, we see a sampling of recently discovered objects which have transformed our view of early medieval culture across the Gallic and Anglo-Saxon world. On the screen, we see a sam, oh, sorry, this, <laughs> nervous. This rich new evidence of materials culture has come to us by a range of events and processes. From chance metal detectors finds, such as the Staffordshire and Galloway hordes, to large projects that include systematic explorations of Cranogs in Ireland and Scotland, large-scale excavations on Iona and the Tarbat Peninsula of Dunod and of the Prittlewell burial. Our growing understanding of this culture's brilliance has been, en has been enabled by new technologies, advanced archeological methods and laws requiring investigation of construction sites. Increased public awareness has furthered the cause. The portable antiquity scheme and education through museums and programs such as the training of farmers and peat cutter operators in Ireland, one of whom recognized the fat and more salter his peat, his peat cutter had dug up. We have a previously unimaginable catalog of objects and an unprecedented depth of interpretation. Alongside rising awareness of insular material culture sophistication, Dr. Jennifer O'Reilly stands out among scholars asking new questions in their studies of early medieval textual 
and visual culture. Dr. O'Reilly was a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries. She lectured on medieval history at University College Cork until her retirement in 2008. She continued to lecture and publish groundbreaking studies on insular art. Today is the fifth anniversary of her death. It is an appropriate time to remember her vast contribution to the history of insular art and to bring attention to her brilliant scholarship's potential to bring another dimension of understanding to recently discovered objects. Some of her most insightful studies were on the images in two famous manuscripts, the Codex Amiatinus, the massive and highly important one volume Bible manuscript made at Wormuth Jarrow in the late seventh or early eighth century, which you're seeing on the left there, and the Book of Kells on the right, a lavishly decorated manuscript of the four gospels made probably sometime around 800, quite possibly at Iona. On the screen, her portrait casts a fresh and profoundly knowledgeable gaze upon two of their folios. I wish here to spread awareness of the magnitude of her scholarship and its continuing relevance to medieval studies. Using the Prittlewell gold crosses as entry level objects, I will present the main points of her, of her unique methodology and her ideas about relationships of image and viewer. Then I'm going to give some examples to show how Jennifer's scholarship may open new dimensions to our view of these exciting new objects. We now see, I hope, the burial chamber's reconstruction. It's surrounded by uh, some of the objects conserved by the specialist team from the Museum of London. Their 500 page detailed report epitomizes the abilities of present day archeology. span The tomb's reconstruction and its objects are evocative of the seventh century in its physical and imaginative dimensions. The Molas team have unpacked vast amounts of information from each object. They have shed light on the social context of a seventh century elite person who lived during the beginning of Christianity's growth in Anglo-Saxon England. I'm going to focus now on the pair of gold crosses, which you see on the lower right. Uh, these, the archeological team think may have been placed over the eyes of the dead person. They suggest that the crosses were intended as amulets to protect the soul from evil. The crosses reveal the deceased Christianity that's remarkable in the early part of the seventh century, probably only decades after the mission sent by Pope Gregory to the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms of Kent. I begin with the Prittlewell tomb because besides the Christian features, it clearly projects status and power in its external appearance. But Jennifer detailed many times in her scholarship that the sense of vision in the early medieval period was not just external. Its power lay as a path to the interior of the viewer, a power that acted in the imagination of the Christian viewer. In the Prittlewell monograph, Simon Bernal points out the depiction of the cross borne by Christ and Simon of Cyrene in the sixth, late sixth century gospel book known as the St. Augustine Gospels. It was made in Italy, but now it's in Cambridge. Uh, it was present early in the seventh century in England. The small picture is within a grid of scenes from the gospels. Simon Bernal compares this with the gold crosses to show their similarity with the Latin cross form in the picture. He argues that the idea for the gold crosses came from Roman Christian context of somewhere, probably Rome. Uh, and that uh, it, and that kind of context was being established in southeastern England by the missionary Augustine. Augustine was sent by Pope Gregory I from Rome, we remember. 
In the seventh century context, an emphatically Latin cross would itself suggest connection with Rome. Why would the crosses be placed over the eyes of the dead? Simon Bernal points out the rich significances of uh, the crosses would have brought to the burial. The idea of sight's path to the soul has its basis in scripture and was developed in patristic and insular commentaries, prayers, and liturgy. That is a prominent theme in Jennifer's scholarship. She may show us how the crosses can be understood as an embodiment in appropriate form and material of an internalization of Christianity belonging to the person in the burial chamber. Crosses had, by the end of the seventh century, become a decorative element integrated, almost con often concealed in all media. The act of viewing them could serve contemplative revelation of Christian beliefs, of Christ's incarnation, sacrifice, and promise of salvation and resurrection. The Codex Amiatinus begins with a series of tables and diagrams. These are based on the writings of St. Jerome. Um, Amiatinus, the manuscript, has the best and earliest surviving manuscript of his Vulgate edition of the Latin Bible. One of the diagrams, which is now on the right, concerns the books of the Pentateuch, or the first five books of the Old Testament. Each of the small circles in it has a slightly compressed comment of Jerome uh, on the, uh, from a letter uh, that he wrote to Paulinus of Nola. Uh, and these comments concern the mysteries or signs of divine meaning in each book of the Pentateuch. A blue band entwines the five circles, uh, tracing smaller loops between them, but it increases the number of loops on the upper and lower arms of the arrangement to draw a Latin cross. A simply designed diagram of the books of the law and their interpretation becomes a vision of Roman Christian orthodoxy. Visual apprehension of the Latin cross is analogous to the viewer's spiritual transformation. Seeing the Latin cross is a necessary element of transformation of the diagram from a list of the books of Moses to Christian sign revealing prophetic truths. It is worth pointing out Jerome's comments on Numbers and Leviticus, that Numbers, which is uh, in the right circle, the circle in the, on the right, uh, Numbers contains hidden mysteries, he says, in all the measures and quantities it mentions. Jerome says of Leviticus, which is in the central circle, center circle, Leviticus is every word, including on the vestments of the priest Aaron, signifies heavenly sacred things, we shall see two relevant objects from the Staffordshire hoard. Besides textual and iconographic relationships to some of the objects we are going to see, the diagram brings out Jennifer's fundamental concern to understand insular art's call to a spiritual vision. Jennifer makes concise methodological and conceptual statements in her 1987 article, Early Medieval Text and Image. In the article, she investigates the iconography of a late 10th century Anglo-Saxon whalebone panel. On it, Christ, his hands up and chest bared, sits enthroned within a mandorla between the figures of the Virgin and St. Peter. Beneath them, a pair of hovering angels hold the arms of a cross, and eight figures look up at it. It's very damaged. Uh, the, the mandorla's border is inscribed, Fridete Manus et Pedis, see my hands and feet, which is an abbreviation of Luke chapter 4, 24, verse 39. The inscription refers to the five wounds of Christ's crucified and resurrected body. His bared chest displays the spear wound, his hand and, originally, his feet, the nail piercings. J 
Jennifer explains her aim to understand, quote, something of the imaginative processes of an early medieval monastic culture. The basis of her method was the patristic contemplative practice of the katena, a prayer-like form of exegesis which linked together chains of biblical text to review to reveal scripture's underlying spiritual meaning, a meaning hidden from the literal reader. Insular monastic culture perpetuated this tradition with its themes maintained and developed since, since Christianity's first centuries. But she says, it could also use that tradition to make new associations or creatively reestablish, restate established themes. Writing of the ivory as a highly elusive pictorial exegesis, Jennifer traces a chain of texts that appears as early as a sixth century sermon of Caesarius of Arles and in later Old English eschatological literature. The theme describes Christ enthroned in majesty. He tells sinners, see the marks left by the nails, the wound in my side. No single gospel mentions all five wounds or the enthroned Christ. The exegetical and devotional tradition derives from verses of, in gospels of Matthew and Mark and revelations for the enthronement and from the post-resurrection accounts in Luke and John for the wounds. The phrase, they shall look upon him whom they have pierced is from Zechariah and repeated in John and Revelations. That's for the invocation of seeing the wounds. So these are all taken from different places in the Bible. This katana chain of texts presented an ancient theme that underlay a devotional image familiar to early medieval Christians. It invoked their compunction to recognize the incarnate Christ, his sacrifice on earth and his heavenly presence whence he would appear to judge with his wounds testifying to his human and divine nature. Often the images were inscribed with these textual references, inspiring imaginative conversation between text and image. The whalebone ivory represents a summation of all these concepts in a single object. The chain of paradoxical crucifixion, resurrection, triumph, and enthronement were closely associated throughout the Middle Ages, becoming elaborated and adapted in devotional and liturgical forms. Always the experience of the viewer was the target of the textual and visual forms. This experience took place in the visual, in the viewer's imagination, invoking compunction and an interiorization of the ideas of Christian salvation. Jennifer understood the Katana's flexibility. It emerges in many of her publications alongside other themes. The large gold cross in the Staffordshire hoard is one of the most striking of recent insular discoveries, but even in its reconstruction, it does not speak openly to modern viewers. As Jennifer said of another insular work, it presents a mystery revealed yet concealed. In the excellent discussions in the Society of Antiquaries monograph on the Staffordshire hoard, it is understood as a splendid processional or altar cross originally set with six garnets, a Latin cross with an equal armed cross at its center as seen in the reconstruction drawing there on the, on the right. The monograph gives detailed discussions of its material and background in early medieval culture. Moreover, many scholars have analyzed the significance of red garnets in Anglo-Saxon gold crosses as iconography of the wounds of Christ. Seventh century viewers certainly would have contemplated the wounds, the divine and human natures, and the promise of salvation. The Staffordshire cross's surface is decorated also with animal interlace, 
which is directly from the pre-Christian art traditions, art traditions of the Anglo-Saxons. The, mon the monograph's authors reason that its skilled integration of beautifully rendered native decoration with the elegant design of the Christian cross indicates its production in an elite, wealthy context within decades of the mission from Rome. Chris Fern suggests that the form of the protrusions at the ends of the upper arms of the cross are a native innovation. I hope you can see those in the, in the, in the crumpled cross and then also the, the reconstruction. Their native innovation, Chris Fern says, integrating shapes of animal ears consistent with the object's zoomorphic art. This would create a vision of the cross as a living thing, the symbol of the incarnate and crucified Christ. Crosses were living things in early medieval Christianity, often with reference to the tree in Genesis, uh, the story of the fall. Another interpretation may see the protrusions as suggestions of leaves. In the monograph, Leslie Webster brings out the cross's relationships to jeweled triumphal crosses Actual examples survive from the fifth to eighth centuries and jeweled crosses are depicted in early Alps mosaics in Rome and Ravenna in which it signifies the triumphant resurrected body of the living Christ appearing from heaven as in the seventh century mosaic in Rome. The triumphal crosses often have protrusions from the ends of the upper beams. In the Roman apse, the cross appears amid flowering plants in a grassy landscape, the early Christian image of heavenly paradise. Jennifer wrote about this relationship of cross and tree in medieval art and literature. In an early publication, she addressed the complex iconography of a late Anglo-Saxon portable altar the crucified Christ appears in a heavenly eschatological scene. He is hanging upon a cross of rough hewn timber, timber, a roof, I'm sorry. This is a reference to the tree of life. I hope you can see how it's rough hewn. It's not smooth boards that he, the cross is made of. We see it again. Uh, the earliest surviving English depiction of the rough hewn cross is in the early 11th century Harley 603 Psalter, but she showed uh, the concept's familiarity from at least the 6th century in exegesis, liturgy, and hymns. In the Harley Psalter, it references the splendid imperial Roman standard of triumph, the vexillum adorned with the instruments of the passion. Its paradox as rough hewn tree and shining vexillum is part of its effectiveness as a mystery or sign intended for contemplation to, review, to reveal something of the salvation offered to those who take the idea of sight via, the idea via sight of the cross into their hearts. Visual images of the cross as tree of life were being made by the sixth century. Ampules, that is small containers for holy oil, were made in the Holy Land for pilgrims to take home. Many bear an image of the cross made of palm branches. The one seen here has a palm crown cross upon Golgotha encircled by the Greek inscription, oil from the tree of life. As Leslie Webster suggests in her essay on the Staffordshire Gold Cross, its animal ornament may represent a local substitute for the vine scrolls, which appear on some early Byzantine jeweled crosses. Vine scrolls with animal inhabitants on Anglo-Saxon stone crosses, such as the 8th century Ruthwell Cross, can, as Jennifer has said, 
quote, reveal the stone cross is the arbor vitae, the cosmological tree of life, a figure of the sacramental and glorified body of Christ. Emphasizing the seeming, she's emphasizing the seeming paradox of his divine and human nature. As Leslie has also pointed out, uh, use uh, this native zoomorphic ornament to represent the cross as, the cross as a living corporeal thing, which simultaneously has a cosmological existence, appears early in the early eighth century Lindisfarne Gospels, especially in the carpet page before the Gospel of Matthew, which we're seeing on the right now, but now you're not. In one of the diagrams of the biblical book books uh, in the Codex Amiatinus, flower and leaf forms convey the living cross by sprouting from the angles of its cross shape. The ends of the cross's beams sprout a leaf at each angle, resembling the Staffordshire cross's projections. The shape of the cross could be decor creatively decorated, modified, or inscribed. The cross as tree of life materialized a cosmological sign of a fundamental Christian mystery, the dual nature of Christ, human and divine, whose physical body resurrected remains in heaven and on earth in the community of believers to return at the end of time, displaying his wounds as testimony of his incarnate and divine nature. Jennifer's groundbreaking paper on the crucifixion picture in the late seventh century Durham Gospels gives a detailed interpretation against a complex late seventh century theological background. The Durham Gospels were made in either Ireland or Northumbria in a monastery with a definite Irish presence. Barely visible Latin inscriptions surround the picture, and all but two of these are too complex to deal with now. The top margin, first of the two, admonishes the viewer to contemplate Christ's crucified body, his dual nature and sacrifice. The top arm of the cross has an extended version of the abbreviated title which the Roman soldiers placed onto it, that is the INRI. Either side of the upper arm of the cross that is beside this inscription um, are inscribed the Greek letters Alpha and Omega, a title Christ used of himself, the beginning and end, here leaving no doubt as to his true identity and emphasizing the paradox of crucifixion between two thieves and eternal divine nature. Dressed in the priestly ankle length garment, Christ's body displays nails in hands and feet and conforms to the cross's unusual shape. Its transverse beam placed so that it is in the visual center of the picture. Either side of the top arm, a pair of angelic beings chants Sanctus. Christ's body is present in heaven, eternally praised in the heavenly liturgy, as in Revelations. In the lower earthly half, the Roman soldier thrusts his spear into Christ's side, and another raises the sponge to Christ's face. Elements of the scriptural narratives are compressed into one synchronous image that prompts the viewer to contemplate the crucified body and the symmetrical cosmological cross it spans the cardinal points of earth and heaven and all of time. My, my highly simplified summaries of Jennifer's profound interpretations may help to understand the ways in which even a now fragmented cross would have addressed its early medieval audience. The Tully Loch cross was found on the bottom of a lake in County Roscommon in Ireland in 1986, probably in the condition we see here. It was a processional and altar cross, probably made in the early ninth century. Gilt, <coughs> gilt bronze metalwork pieces 
are mounted on both sides of a wooden core. Each side has two plaques bearing a human figure, hands upraised in a pose of prayer and flanked by a pair of open jawed animals. Jennifer's extensive explorations of crucifixion iconography spotlighted insular creative representation of the human figure to make reference to and elaborate upon the body of Christ. These figures may present variations on the crucified body meant to invoke this, the viewer's spiritual vision. In the Durham Gospels crucifixion figure that we just looked at, Christ's arms coincide with the centrally placed crossbar. They turn unnaturally outward at the elbow. The body takes on the shape of the cosmological cross, creating a sign of his unity of heaven and earth, human and divine. The upraised arms of the Tolly Loch figures merge a pose of prayer with the pose of martyrs and crucifixion, invoking the sacrifice of the incarnate Christ. The animals bring imagery of Daniel in the lion's den for insular viewers, a sign of Christian martyrdom, but also the composition symmetry recalls images of enthronement, heavenly exaltation. The figure in the upper panel has eyes open. Hope you can see that. Uh, the lower eyes are closed. That's clearer, I think. The fig, uh, the, this is perhaps a mnemonic of earthly vision's limits and the truth of spiritual vision. But this fragmentary object yields only a suggestion of the original cross's conversation with scripture and its early medieval viewers. Okay, I'm pointing to the crosses, to the figures. The cross is contemporary, the Book of Kells has a picture of the body of Christ to compare with the Tolle Loch figures. The picture is placed in the Gospel of Matthew. It has above Christ's head, Matthew's words at the end of the account of the Last Supper. Christ's body becomes simultaneously a cross in the pose of prayer as the Tolle Loch figures and an X shape or a key or chi, a version of the cross and the letter of Christ. Crucifixion and sacrifice are emphasized with the cross-shaped capitals either side of his head and by the text on the facing page, which merges bread and body, wine and blood in sign and sacrifice. Jennifer wrote of this picture as a monumental hieratic image, the composition of which radically renews early Christian representations of the exalted Christ as triumphal cross or the key, the X, beneath an honorific arch. Her detailed pursuit of chains of text of, uh, of all the elements in the picture in the Book of Kells has many resonances with other figures in insular art that have iconographic associations with the crucifixion. Besides the cross and crucifixion, an interpretative chain which Jennifer pursued was the patristic and early medieval conversion of themes in the Pentateuch, the Ark of the Covenant and priesthood to figures of Christ, Christian writers and the church. Her rich assembly of texts, which she, she, which she elegantly relates to the pictures in the Codex Amiatinus reveals their sophisticated exposition of the eloquence of Jerome's Vulgate Latin Bible. As mentioned, when looking at the Pentateuch cross diagram in Amiatinus, uh, numbers, according to Jerome, gives numbers and measures of the earth that are signs of divine truth. Versions of phrases from numbers uh, are inscribed in Latin on both sides of the Staffordshire Hoard's fragmentary gold strip. And this inscription is, rise up, O Lord, and may your enemies be scattered, and those who hate you flee before your face. This is Moses' daily prayer, calling upon God's presence in the ark to protect the Jews from their enemies 
as they continue their journey through the desert with the ark carried before them. Psalm 67 has a version of it, and patristic psalm commentaries consistently associate this prayer with Moses. The prayer appears to have been familiar enough in 8th century Mercian context to have been put in the mouth of the East Anglian ex-warrior hermit, St. Cuthlac. Leslie Webster and Alan Thacker placed the strip and its inscription in early Anglo-Saxon religious, social, and political contexts. Leslie convincingly argues that the strip was part of a cross that was attached to a reliquary, not a freestanding cross. And she points out that, that arca, the ark was a word used for reliquaries. Jennifer wrote interpretations of the pictures of the tabernacle and the scribe in the Codex Amiatinus, as well as the depictions of the temple and ark in the books of Kells and Armagh. She related them to Bede's exegetical works on the tabernacle and the temple. While she never explored Moses' prayer over the ark, she wrote about the intense exegetical attention paid to it in insular Christianity. Leslie and Allen emphasize the consistency of the overwhelmingly militaristic nature of the objects in the Staffordshire horde with the context and content of Moses' prayer. The inscribed strip would seem to fit on a reliquary carried, carried before troops as they marched into battle. Jennifer wrote very little on the secular associations and supernatural protective functions of insular art but she laid out in depth the significance of the ark and tabernacle for insular monastic culture. Her scholarship on Bede's exegesis immerses us in the richness of his use of the divinely designed structures as interpretative figures of the body of Christ, which could be an appropriate reference for a cross attached to a reliquary. In her essays on the Codex Amiatinus, Jennifer wrote important interpretations on the picture of the scribe. The scribe wears the vestments of a biblical high priest, including the headdress at the center of his forehead. Jerome consistently translated the Hebrew name for this uh, thing that he's wearing on the front of his head as a lamina aurea, or thin gold plate. One of the objects reconstructed from the Staffordshire hoard resembles the scribe's headdress in the picture, although it is not literally the same. It does not have the four letters of the divine name as described in Exodus uh, chapter 28. The lamina aurea is mentioned also in Leviticus chapter eight. In the Codex Amiatinus' diagram of the books of the Pentateuch, Jerome's comment on Leviticus is in the center. In every element of the priest's vestments, he signify, uh, he says, every element of the priest's vestments signifies sacred heavenly things. Jerome briefly interprets the Lamina Aurea in another letter to Fabiola, a woman named Fabiola. He only comments on the significance of the dark blue ribbon, which holds the lamina aurea to the priest's forehead. The word of God crowns and shields the priest with beauty. In the Staffordshire Horde monograph, Leslie Webster and Alan Thacker discuss the object's possible historical relationships to late Roman and early medieval texts and they propose possible significance of such a headdress in the seventh century church in England. Jennifer drew together the interpretations of Cassian, Origen, Jerome, Gregory, and Bede in her aim to uncover the significance of the Amiatinus scribe's vestments. These writings could give some idea of what an object such as the reconstructed headdress from the Staffordshire Horde might have meant to the spiritual vision of a seventh century Anglo-Saxon. If the object from the Staffordshire Horde was made after biblical descriptions and interpretations of the Lamina Aurea by Jerome and possibly Josephus, uh, Bede's 
uh, we have to remember that Bede's exegesis had not yet been written, then the object which one of the authors of the monograph describes as too flimsy to be worn must have functioned in some symbolic way. The seventh century Anglo-Saxon imagination would have prov provided a fertile and rigorous ground in which the object could work as a crown and shield for the beauty of the church as understood by the Anglo-Saxon elite who were so rep well represented in the hordes by heaps of splendid military equipment. Jennifer has drawn our attention to the insular interest in Jewish priestly vestments. They are described, as I just point, said, uh, in Exodus and Leviticus and interpreted by Josephus, a first century Romano Jewish historian. In her essay on the late eighth century St. Gall Gospels of Irish origin, uh, an essay which she unfortunately left unfinished, she notes Bede's interpretations of the fine linen turban, which covers and adorns the head of the high priest in his De Tabernaculo. He and Josephus describe a headdress like that worn by the figure of Matthew in the St. Gall Gospels. She points out that Bede considered Matthew the Hebrew evangelist, a feature stressed in the exegetical tradition in the Hebrew names uh, that, that are found in the Bible. The linen turban and the lamina aurea make an appearance in the Book of Kells in the picture of the temptation of Christ. The temple in Jerusalem is shown as the body of Christ with references to the tabernacle and the colors and design over its exterior. A figure stands in what seems to be the doorway. At first glance, the figure seems to have a halo outlined in red or perhaps that's his hair. A careful look, though, reveals folds and an embellishment at center front. The best explanation for this headdress is that it's based on the scriptural and exegetical descriptions of the linen turban with the lamina for aurea over the forehead. Jennifer illuminates patristic and insular interpretations based on Katina, chains of text, to propose that the temple in the illustration refers to the priesthood within the body of Christ. This theme is linked to Jerome's interpretation of Luke as the priest, his sign, the ox or calf of sacrifice. According to Jennifer, the figure in the book of Kells, like the scribe in Amiatinus, is the holy man who studies the chains of meaning in scripture. For this reason, he is clothed in, clothed in priestly vestments given by God to the priest Aaron. The vestments are signs of his having inscribed the spiritual wisdom of scripture on his heart, and so is worthy to approach the ark. The Book of Kells calls upon the viewer's spiritual vision in many ways, where the temptation figure presents a complex figure of Christ, of the body of Christ, and human figures within a scene, however complex its symbiosis, it can be called a picture. The artists of the Book of Kells merged and mixed the concepts of picture and diagram, picture and design to challenge spiritual vision. In these pages, artists made use of elements from native pre-Christian traditions of the Gallic Celtic world. The cosmological key-shaped framework of the four symbols page before the Gospel of John integrates the spirals and trumpet patterns of late Latin art, seen here in the seventh century, hanging bowl disc from Dunod. The spirals inserted within the square insets in the outer border <clears throat> emphasize the four-part heavenly framework which carries the four animals, signs of the evangelists and their gospels. Jennifer wrote eloquent and innovative essays on the significance of such four-part designs in insular gospel manuscripts. 
seeing the patterns cover the surface of the shrine taken from River Blackwater near Clonmore in County Armagh. One gets a sense that they too may have called in some way to spiritual vision, perhaps merging Christian signs with local traditions. In the St. Gall Gospels, cross patterns are concealed within the borders above and below the evangelist. As Jennifer shows us, the side borders have large panels within each a lozenge shape filled with spirals, carefully articulated with color. In each corner of the frame, rectangular panels present the symbols of the evangelist, conveying, Jennifer says, their familiar allusion to the fourfold gospel and its revelation of Christ in his humanity and divinity, his kingship and priesthood. She cites Ernst Kitzinger, Kitzinger's observations on the visual power of this frame. Quote, by surrounding the evangelist with interlace and interlacing animal ornament, the insular artist coming from a more deeply rooted tradition of conveying spiritual force in visual terms had intensified the potency of imported representational art. One might be reminded of her words upon seeing the Dragonstone from Port Mahomoc in Northeast Scotland, which you see on the left, on the right. This stone was part of a three meter tall Pictish cross slab. The head of the cross would have been encircled by panels of spirals, some set in lozenges, similar to the ones in the frame of the St. Gall Mark portrait. Jennifer writes almost exclusively about Christian art, rarely about the pre-Christian tradition. Nevertheless, she shows us how insular artists merge an iconic and abstract shapes with representational images in creative and sophisticated ways to invoke the special imaginative vision of the early Middle medieval eye. And she never published anything on the newly got discovered objects I've presented. I hope, however, that you may see that what she wrote helps to set them in context. Her approach to early medieval art is not the only one that is valuable in this way. Let us remember her and continue to benefit from her legacy of profound knowledge of patristic and early medieval culture and her method of seeing with early medieval eyes. Jennifer never published a monograph or survey book, but the body of her work has a remarkable wholeness. That is part of its brilliance. Knowing this, some of us who knew her and her scholarship have edited three volumes of her writings, published by Variorum in 2019 and now displayed on the screen. And I wish to thank my co-editors, Elizabeth Mullins, Lauren McCarran, and Jarmut Scully. We are all extremely grateful to Tom O'Reilly and Professor Terry O'Reilly for seeing the volumes through to publications. Thank you. Carol, thank you very much indeed. Um, I should have mentioned for those not familiar with how these things work, um, that questions are extremely welcome using the chat function. Um, and we, at the moment, I have... Paul, well, may I start yep. off with a, with a question, an observation? No, Carol, thank you. That was, that was a wonderful, wonderful talk. I just want to make one point about your starting off point, which is the Prittlewell burial. Um, our current understanding is that that is more likely to be a very late 6th century burial than a 7th century burial, um, certainly within a decade of Augustine's arrival in Kent, conceivably antedating uh, Augustine's arrival in Kent. I just wanted to make that point in case there are people in the audience who um, have, have read the arguments in the in the monograph and thought that maybe the position had shifted, but it's, it's, a, it's more probably late sixth century than early seventh. Okay, sorry about that. Thank you for letting me know. I, uh, I have the book and I did read it. <laughs> Um, it's a very dense argument, I have to say. <laughs> but I, I, I thought that the idea 
uh, that Simon was saying was that it, it was related to the Gregorian mission. Um, it's it's a, it's a moot it's a moot point. I think it's worth going back to look at the other, certainly the the discussion of the chronology and then the other possibilities that are in the. Yeah, yeah. Of course, there 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 were there was Christianity in Kent before this. Of course, um, uh, Gregory sent the the mission to Kent probably for that reason. I would think. So, so yes, thank you very much. I'm sorry. That's all right. <laughs> right. We we have a comment from Katie Cubitt. Um, please may I make an observation about priestly turbans. I would like to draw Carol's attention to a 10th century German example. I don't know whether we have the facility for Katie to say more or um, appear. But if she has anything more to, to say, can I? Is, would that be, uh, Katie, would that be uh, um, in the, the book, Adam Cohen's book? Um, yeah, she's here. Okay. Ah, no. Yes, hello, Katie. I, I, I'm afraid I'm, I'm told that uh, she'll have to type it in. Um, we don't have the facility to for uh, participants to speak. Okay. So. Yes, I, I, I believe I know of the example that, that you were, that you're speaking of, Katie. Yes. Right. Any, <laughs> any, any further questions? or comments. Um, yes, yes it's, Carol it's, said it, it's the Utah Codex. Utah Codex, yes. Yes, I know that one too. It's, it's just that it's rather later than the Codex Amiatinus and, uh, and also the Book of Kells. But there are, there are interesting relationships. Yeah, thank you. Well, if... If there are no further questions or comments, um, then uh, I, Carol, thank you very much indeed for a fascinating overview of Jennifer's work and the connections between the objects and the images, the um, synchronous image drawing on different sources. Um, I'm not a specialist in the period, but that, that was um, a, a, a new thought um, as far as I was concerned. Um, no. Oh, excuse me, do I need to put up my screen with the next, next, uh, I have that on my PowerPoint if I share it, yeah. Mm. Do you see it? Okay, sorry. Yeah. There. Ah, sorry. No, no not necessarily. <laughs> um, but thank you for doing that anyway. That takes me to um, uh, the close. I give notice that the next meeting will be on Thursday, the 25th of February 2021, when we will hear a paper. The Stonehenge Hidden Landscapes Project and the Durrington Walls Pit Circle by Professor Vincent Gaffney, FSA. The meeting stands adjourned.